Today I'm going to continue the Ancient Pottery Challenge by making the El Paso Polychrome Jar. If you're hoping to follow along today, you're going to need a lump of clay, a large pookie, a gourd scraper, a scraping tool, a cutting tool, a polishing stone, and a small piece of buckskin. If you're ready, let's get started. Those of you that follow me on Instagram have maybe seen the video where the light falls on my head while I'm trying to pat out a slab of clay. This is where that happens. If you don't follow me on Instagram, you might want to go over there and see that because it is kind of funny. For this pot, I'm using this big wooden bowl that I got at Target. And so working in a big wooden bowl like this has its own challenges. It makes a great pookie. It's really the perfect shape and size for what I'm trying to do here. The problem is that you can't just leave the pot sitting in the pookie indefinitely, you know, for like days, because what happens is the wood will absorb some of that moisture and start to swell, and then the pot will really stick in there. So, This is a custom clay that I mixed up for this project. It's about two parts Old Sonoida Highway red clay from here near Tucson. It's about one part West Branch clay, which is also from here in Tucson, and then, and then maybe another part of this green clay that I get near the airport in Safford, Arizona. And the reason I mixed up this kind of unique batch of clay from all over the place is I was looking for brown. The Old Sonoda Highway Red is just too red for what I wanted. And I wanted something that was a little softer than that as well. So that West Branch clay is soft, but it's a little too soft and a little too brown. So I put in that Safford clay because it has a lot of plasticity and I thought it would kind of give it the working qualities I was looking for. The problem with mixing a custom batch of clay like this is you're stuck with however much you mix. Because I didn't mix it in a set proportion, you know, it was just kind of a little bit of this and a little bit of that thrown together. If I start running out of clay as I'm building, and this is a pretty big pot, right? If I start running out of clay, I can't just mix up another batch. I'm pretty much stuck with what I have. And this becomes a problem later on in this project, as I'll show you. I try to read and respond to most, if not all, of the comments on my channel. And that can be a big job. But the advantage of that is, I feel like I really have a finger on the pulse of my audience. People ask me questions and then I can respond to those in videos. One of the things that I've been asked a lot recently is how to make a pot symmetrical. So let me take a minute right now to talk about what you need to do to make sure your pot comes out symmetrical. Because this is really the stage at which you would focus on that. So as I'm shaping the pot with my scraper, just gently scraping it on the outside, I'm paying special attention to make sure that there's no dents, no divots, no bumps, that it's all smooth and even. And I'm scraping it in different directions. So I'll scrape down from the top, I'll scrape horizontally, I'll scrape diagonally, and I'll scrape vertically. And I'm using my hand on the inside to push out areas, to hold it in place so I don't press too much when I'm scraping it. The hand on the inside is as important as the scraper on the outside. Also rotate it as you work, rotate it a little, scrape some more, rotate it, scrape. So take your time when the pot is at this stage and just focus on making it symmetrical. Look for any irregularities and get rid of them. Now here's what I was talking about. Look, I've got a very small amount of clay left. So at this point I'm kind of worried that I'm gonna have enough clay to finish this up. I still have to put the neck on this jar and I don't wanna run out of clay because there's no way I'm ever gonna get that mix the same again. So I'm making the neck extra thin in the hopes of stretching that clay out and making sure there's enough. Now here's where I make my first mistake. I put on this big fat coil and I pinch it up and you can see here probably already what the problem is. I just put way too much neck on it and I spent a great deal of time trimming the rim off smooth and smoothing it out and getting it all looking good. And you know, it looks pretty good but if you look at the prehistoric example, if you look at the original pot that I'm supposed to be replicating, it doesn't have that much neck. But I got it all done, went inside, sat down on my computer, looked at the original and decided I had to do something. I didn't want to do it, but if I'm making a replica, I need to try to make it as close to the replica as I can. And that means I had to come out here and trim off some of this extra rim. It also means I'm gonna to have to redo the smoothing and trimming of the rim. So I'm just using my needle tool to trim that down and then I will go about the smoothing process a second time. And I think the second one was right. You know, if you look at the picture of the original, it's much closer in shape and size now, much more like the original. 
And with that, a little bit of smoothing with wet fingers and a damp piece of buckskin, and I really am finished up forming the pot, ready to hang it up for the evening. Okay, second day. Last night I let this dry uncovered for a couple of hours out here until it had firmed up enough that I could set it upside down. And then as soon as I could, I flipped it over onto its rim and pulled the pookie off. And the reason was, this is a wooden bowl that I'm using for a pookie, so you need to be really careful. If you leave the pot in there for too long, then the wood can start to swell, and then you can get a real problem with getting the pot out of the pookie. It could even break the pot as the wood starts to swell around it. So uh, I wanted to get it out of this pookie as soon as I could. Now, I'm still going to use this pookie. I'm going to put the pot back in the pookie as I work on it, but over time, as I let this dry, I'm going to take it out of the pookie as often as I can to give this wood a chance to kind of dry out, not let it get too damp. All right? So my goals for today are to get this scraped down and cleaned up, all the irregularities, especially on the bottom and at the pookie line, and then to let it dry enough that I can put a coat of slip on it before the end of the day. So we'll see how that goes. When you use a piece of cloth to keep the clay from sticking in the pookie, the problem is you get all these little folds and wrinkle spots where the cloth was under there, and you have to deal with that. And so between dealing with the little cloth folds and that little lip that you inevitably get right at the pookie line, right where you start coiling above the pookie, you've got to scrape all that smooth, and then I'm using little bits of clay to just press into those gaps, make it all even and smooth, and then I'm using my gourd rib wet to just kind of give it all a nice even coating. And now, now that I've got the bottom relatively cleaned up, I'm placing it back in the pookie and flipping it over so that I can scrape and deal with those irregularities on the top half of the pot. The first thing I'm going to deal with here are dents. There's a little dents in the pot and it's still plastic enough that I can push those out. And this goes back to keeping it symmetrical. And the same goes for scraping it. I'm scraping it with this deer rib here and I'm paying special attention to any place where it seems a little high and so that it's all symmetrical and even all the way around. And then a little coating of water will kind of help smooth out that rough texture that the scraping creates. And now I'm just planning ahead for tomorrow. Tomorrow I'm going to be slipping the pot, and so I store my slip dry, so I'm just hydrating it now so that by tomorrow it's ready to use. All right, third day. I didn't get the slipping done yesterday because this cool, damp winter weather means that the pot is drying slower than I'm used to. Now, I'm definitely going to get it slipped today. I'm ready to start slipping now. But I don't know if I'm going to get the polishing done because, again, that's dependent on the weather and whether or not I can get it dry enough. It is fairly damp and cool today. In fact, it's raining outside right now, so we'll see how that goes. Now, this El Paso Polychrome was not highly polished. It wasn't polished to a glossy, smooth finish. It was just quickly run over with a smooth stone to make it a little smoother than it would be otherwise. In fact, let me go into El Paso Polychrome a little bit and tell you the history of this pottery type, and then I'll come back and do the slipping. El Paso Polychrome was made across a wide area, from West Texas to Southeast New Mexico, and northern Chihuahua, Mexico, by people of the Hornada branch of the Mogollon culture. It evolved out of Mogollon brownware around 1000 AD, and it was made for over 400 years, and during that time, it changed very little. Archaeologists in the American Southwest often use small, stylistic, and technological changes in pottery types over time to date ruins, but this proves extremely difficult with El Paso polychrome because it seems to stay pretty much the same over the 400 plus year period in which it was made. It appears that this type was used as utilitarian pottery for tasks like cooking, brewing beer, storing grain, hauling water, as well as for ceremonial uses. Because this pottery was so utilitarian and rather sloppily decorated, the late archeologist Charles de Peso famously called it the tin can of the ancient Southwest, and yet, the often sloppy decorations belie the skill with which El Paso Polychrome was made. The walls of this pottery type are often incredibly thin, even on extremely large pots, which is the real indicator of the mastery of the ancient Hornada Mogion potters. One of the truly great things about pottery is that there are no right and wrong answers. There's a million ways to do things, and they're all okay, as long as that works for you. That being said, 
It can take a long time to figure out the way to make pottery on your own just through trial and error. I know because I did it. If you want to take advantage of my years of trial and error, you can take one of my online master classes, which teach the four critical areas of primitive pottery, wild clay, coil construction, outdoor pottery firing, and natural paints, pigments, and minerals. I'll put the link on the screen and down in the doobly-doo in case you're interested in checking those classes out. Today the pot is finally dry enough to begin polishing it. So I'm just using a smooth stone that I found on the beach to just go over it lightly and, and just smooth out all the clay. I'm not trying to make it glossy at this point, I'm just smoothing it out a little bit. Check out this golden quartz polishing stone I picked up recently. Isn't that beautiful? Now I'm changing polishing stones here because when I'm polishing inside the neck there, the way it kind of curves out, it's good to have a nice rounded edge so I don't gouge the clay that still damps. There it is, all polished and ready to go. Now I just have to let it dry slowly until it's dry enough and then I'll paint it. Pay attention now and I'll give you my not so secret recipe for black mineral paint. One part manganese dioxide. You can go out and explore and find this mineral for yourself or you can buy it online. One part copper carbonate. Again, you can find it or buy it online. One part ground clay. Add water. Mix it up really good. And now, the secret ingredient, mesquite sap. Any kind of sap will do. This is an organic binder to make the paint more sticky, to help it flow on the pot, off the brush, etc. And I just crush those nodules up and grind them in the same way I did the minerals. And when you get the right consistency, the right amount of moisture to materials, you're ready to paint it on. Now when you're freehanding a design like this, uh, you it can be nerve-wracking, especially that first line. But know this, you will make mistakes. And with this mineral paint, those mistakes will be permanent. But you can paint around those mistakes and chances are nobody will even notice them. So you just got to dive in and get started. One thing I want to point out to you is how when I'm painting, I'm often anchoring my hand with my pinky. And if you watch these clips I've compiled here of my painting, you will see a lot of instances where I anchor with my pinky and then pull the brush across the pot. By the way, there's one of those mistakes I was talking about. I bet you can't see it. And there's how I dealt with that mistake. I bet you still don't see it. Go ahead and leave it in the comments if you think you found this mistake. The point is you're gonna make mistakes with this paint and you need to just incorporate those mistakes into your design and move on, not worry too much about it. Altogether, I spent about four or five hours painting the designs on this pot. Okay, I got it all done. I think it came out pretty good. Now, in these Ancient Pottery Challenge videos, I usually try to show you the whole process from beginning all the way through firing. And in this case, I'm not going to fire it in this video because I have to help my son move to Montana starting tomorrow. So I'll be gone for about a week. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up and do that later. Now in the meantime, if you want to learn more about that manganese based paint that I told you you could find for yourself in nature, I made a video a while back about where and how I collected this manganese mineral that I use for paint. And so I'll link that up right over here so you can go check out that video, learn about collecting and processing your own manganese. So go check that out. I'll go to Montana and I'll catch you next time. Thanks for watching.